Hey guys, Brian Schultz here with Cape Falcon Kayak. And in this video, I wanna talk about a pretty sketchy situation that I got into the other day when I was out doing some research and development testing on the new kayak sailing system that I'm hoping to release sometime around the end of 2022. Now, keep in mind, this wasn't an actual emergency because I did have a fallback plan, but I did have to fall back on that plan and it was more of a survival situation as opposed to what you wanna have actually happen on the water. And the reason I want to share this incident with you is because I think it just contains so many great examples of how your judgment, your paddling fitness, your paddling skill set, your paddling gear, and the conditions you're paddling in can all come together to contribute to safe or potentially dangerous situations on the water. It's also just kind of an entertaining story with lots of great lessons about safety for anyone who's a sea kayaker, anyone who's interested in skin on frame, and anyone who's thinking about adding a sail to any kind of sea kayak. So before we get into this, I am gonna walk you through all the things that I did right and all the things that I did wrong in this progression that led up to the incident. But keep in mind that most of the things that I did wrong, I knew I was doing wrong at the time and I just decided to do it anyways because I was comfortable with the worst case scenario. I felt like best case scenario, I'm just gonna have a really wild, exciting time sailing my kayak for the day worst case scenario, I'm going to end up in the water for a very long and scary swim, and then I'll have some great video footage and I can make a kayak safety video for what not to do. So getting into this here, um, what we're doing right now at this stage in the development of the sailing system is I'm doing a lot of really extreme testing because even though you shouldn't be sailing a kayak in 40 mile per hour winds without all the appropriate rescue and safety gear, that's exactly what someone sometime is gonna end up doing. And I wanna see how the rig and how the kayak behaves in those situations to see if there's anything that I can do to make it more safe. And also just to make sure that there's not gonna be any unexpected hardware failures from things being overstressed. So a couple weeks ago, I took this setup out in the catamaran mode and we just pushed things to the absolute limit. We did have some failures. So I came back, I modified the rig. And the other day I decided to take it out solo so I could test the new modified rig. And I could also test some different sail types and different sail sizes. I had a commercial sail on the back deck that was one square meter. And I had two of my own designs that were 0.8 square meter and one square meter. So kind of just starting out with the beginning of the day here, I got all the normal paddling and safety gear that I had together. I've got this flat deck F1. I've got the sail rig on it. This one happens to have a carbon fiber mass and a carbon fiber boom. I made sure that I had my bilge pump. I had my PFD. I had a knife in my PFD. I had some various pieces of repair equipment for parts that I wanted to be able to fix on the water if I needed to. I also had a whole fistful of energy bars and two water bottles because even though I didn't think I was going to be on the water long enough to eat more than one energy bottle bar and drink a half a water bottle, you just never know what can happen. I also had my day bag that I had warm, dry clothes in because even though it was 90 degrees outside and the water temperature was only 65, if you do go for a long swim, you can get chilled surprisingly easily. Now, I didn't go with a dry suit because I felt like that was gonna roast me alive in those conditions. I just went with a splash top and I kind of planned my paddling. So if I was gonna swim, it wasn't gonna be for a super duper long time. Um, for a spare paddle, I had a full size Greenland paddle on the front deck already assembled. This is something I am passionate about in sea kayaks. I hate break apart paddles because if you end up upside down in a real emergency without your paddle, you do not have time to start like trying to put paddles together. And in extreme conditions, you're gonna have a pretty hard time rolling up with one half of a paddle if you have a sail up at the same time. So full size spare green and paddle on the front deck. And then finally, I got some float bags to put in the end so I would have a little bit of extra flotation. And this was the first mistake that I made because the float bags that I have around the shop right now are the Track 40 liter float bags, which actually work pretty well in my Greenland kayaks and in my smaller modern kayaks. But in the medium sized kayaks and the larger kayaks, they just don't exclude enough water to be able to do a self rescue. Generally speaking, if you really need to be able to do a self rescue in a skin boat, you have to have at least 60 liter float bags in the ends. They need to be fully inflated and it is much preferable if you're paddling with a well-fitted sea sock. Keep in mind, not all sea socks are created equal. The only sea sock that I personally think is safe right now 
is a reed sea sock that is custom fitted to your combing and you need to have at least a three quarter inch lip all the way around to be able to hold on to that because there's nothing more dangerous than a sea sock that you're relying on for a self rescue but actually comes off while you're trying to do that self rescue. So moving on to the launch, we loaded up the kayak, double checked to make sure that we had all our gear and then headed out to the Columbia River Gorge, which forms kind of a natural wind tunnel here in Northwest Oregon, which is what makes it a global Mecca for wind sports. And my plan was to paddle or sail from Viento State Park, which is about seven miles west of Hood River, to the Hood River Boat Basin, and then if I had any energy left in me, I was gonna sail another six miles further to a place that I could get out. And my partner was gonna pace me the entire time in the car. That way, if I had any issues and I had to land early, we could find a way to get me from the shore up to the highway there. Although that's not always the easiest thing to do because there's railroad tracks and sometimes really steep slopes. So, First thing I noticed when we got to Viento State Park is that the wind was blowing much harder than the forecast. The forecast was 15 to 20. The actual wind was more like 30 to 40. And I was actually really surprised when I got down to the beach that it wasn't just clogged with windsurfers and kiteboarders like it usually is. I think I saw one windsurfer and one freefoiler and just a handful of people launching for downwind runs in OC1s and surf skis. So, uh, took a look at the conditions, had a conference, decided that even though it was a lot hairier than I really was hoping for for the trip, I could at least get some good testing in really high winds with the 0.8 square meter sail, which is definitely still overpowered for this size. If you even have the skill set to sail in those conditions in a kayak, you should probably have a 0.7 or even a 0.65 square meter sail. So got everything set up, got down to the water, and launching was actually kind of comical because the wind was blowing so hard that I had to physically tie myself to the boat just to be able to get into it. And something I realized right away, which is just a mistake on my part, is that I'd forgotten my tow tether at home. Normally, if I'm out solo paddling, I have my tow belt, which has a five foot lead on it and a 60 foot lead. And the five foot lead can be really handy, both for when you're trying to get organized in your boat in really windy conditions like that, just so it doesn't take off. And then also, if you end up out of your boat and you need to take a moment and clip in so you don't accidentally lose it in a self rescue situation, it can also be really good for tip clipping the longer section to the bow of your boat just in case you need to swim to a point and then pendulum the boat over to shore. So I didn't have my tow belt with me and that is a pretty major mistake. Now, another major mistake here, which is something I can't really do anything about, is that I have almost no paddling fitness right now. I've been living with a really severe chronic illness for about the last 12 years. And what that means is that aside from boat testing, I literally physically can't get out and paddle. So I headed out with undersized float bags in way too windy of conditions with not enough paddling fitness. Uh, popped the sail up and initially things were going okay. I wasn't super happy with how the whole system was performing. And part of that just has to do with this boat in particular because this kayak is not a standard flat deck F1. It's actually an F1 that I personally modified just doing some design experiments which didn't work out very well and leads to the fact that this boat hunts and weather clocks a lot worse than a standard F1, which is only made worse when you have a sail up and you've got current going against the wind. And so going downwind, it was a little bit squirrely. Going across the wind, I had to use way too much rudder and also paddle input at the same time just to be able to turn it downwind, which really concerned me. So I tried to stay as close to the shore as I could while still staying out in the waves where I could get good wind and learn what I needed to learn. Uh, initially, things were going uh, well, uh, relatively speaking. I was going really fast. I was getting some really good surfs in. And then I had a problem, which I had previously on the catamaran version of these, which was that whenever I would get hit by a gust that was about 40 miles an hour or higher, my sh sheet would start to slip through the clam cleat. And this is something that I didn't know if it was gonna happen on a solo kayak, which is why I wanted to try it a second time. And yes, it does happen on a solo kayak. I don't think it's a problem that anybody would have if they were using these even remotely within the conditions they're designed for, but it was a good thing to know. So I can recommend with people that if they're gonna take these out in truly extreme conditions, they need to switch out the nylon clam cleats for the aluminum clam cleats so they don't slip. 
I was also just having some trouble because every time the sheet would slip, it would cause the sail to flap around really wildly and it would destabilize the boat. And then as I was pulling it in, you have this sketchy moment where you've only got one hand on the paddle and you're trying to cleat it off again. And that problem was made even worse by the fact that I was using open clam cleats instead of closed clam cleats, which is something that I formerly advocated, but now I've changed my mind on. I'm still gonna be using open clam cleats on the canoe sailing system because it's a good safety mechanism. If you end up getting overpowered, you can just blindly swipe across the cleat and release the power. But in a kayak sail, even though that also is true, that moment causes as much problems as it solves because the sail flapping around wildly is as destabilizing as it is dangerous for you not to be able to release that sheet quite as quickly. And so in the future, I'm gonna be switching back to closed clam cleats. So I ended up just getting kind of sketched out. I landed the boat for a minute and I got out my Leatherman and actually switched out this cleat with a different open clam cleat just to see if a fresh, brand new nylon clam cleat would still slip because this is the one that had already slipped a lot during our catamaran experience. And got back out on the water and it turned out that yes, it started slipping again. The gust started getting up to 40 or 50 miles per hour and I was having a really hard time just keeping the sail cleated off. And every single time it would pop, it would end up just, you know, really unstable and I would have a lot of trouble getting it cleated off. And so I was sailing and then my second major failure happened and that is I broke a rudder cable and it wasn't the cable itself that frayed, it was actually the crimp on the end that popped off and then suddenly my rudder is completely useless. So I'm out there, I'm trying to control my sail, my rudder isn't working and I'm in a boat that weathercocks more than my standard boats and I'm working really hard just to get that thing going downwind and finally to try to get it back to shore where I can make some repairs. So I uh, got back to shore, I ended up repairing the rudder, I uh, just basically tied off one side of the rudder cable. So instead of a rudder, I just had a skeg, which also works just fine. And then ended up having to retie my stays because all that really violent flapping around was loosening up my sail stays a bit. And then I got back on the water, started sailing again, and it was just, you know, just really, really extremely high winds. I was sailing consistently at six to eight knots and I was surfing at 11 to 12 miles per hour. So it was just wild and out of control. And me with my personal background, I was just having a great time. I mean, it was a little sketchy with what was happening with the cleat, but otherwise it was all right. Uh, ended up getting knocked over once, just when the whole boat just got out of control, rolled up, everything was fine kept paddling, and then about five minutes later, my sheet popped out one more time, and the sail was just flapping around wildly up front there, and I tried to pull it back in, and as I was trying to pull it back in, the sail developed something that we call in larger boat sailing, a death roll. And what a death roll is, is when you have the belly of the sail ahead of the mast, and it gains lift from the wind going across it. So it violently lurches one direction and then it creates opposite lift and then it goes in the other direction and it just starts going back and forth in this increasing oscillation. And that's what put me in the water. And so ended up in the water, wasn't too concerned about it. You know, so far I have never missed a roll with the sail up and I just figured, you know, just breathe, stay calm, Brian, roll the boat up. So got up on my side, sculled for a second, took a breath, tried to roll the boat up, I couldn't roll, tried to roll again, and I could not get the boat to come up. And I think two things were happening. I was sideways to the wind, which means I had a huge amount of wind pressure pushing the bottom of the boat here, which was pushing me into the water. And also I think the sail was tangled into a scoop, which was trying to lift a bunch of water at the same time. And at this point, I was getting a little bit low on air and I was getting a little bit panicked. So I tried something which was exactly the wrong idea. I, un I undid the halyard, which took the pressure off the mast and caused it to collapse. And as soon as I did that, basically the sail was down in the water. And every time I tried to roll up, what would happen is yeah, I would get stuck and I would not be able to pull that up out of the water. Now, what I should have done in that situation and what I'm almost certain would have worked is if I had just let myself fully capsize and sculled up on the opposite side facing the wind, 
I think as soon as I got up to where I was presenting this face of the boat to the wind, I feel like the rolling effort with that 40 mile per hour wind pressure on the boat would have been able to push me upright even with that sail and I probably could have stayed in my boat. But I panicked at that point, I pulled my skirt and that is the fourth time in 25 years of being a kayaker that I have actually swam out of a boat and it was not a good feeling. I know that for other people, swimming out of your boat and self-rescues are more just a part of how people kayak, and I'm certainly trained for those conditions, but personally, I've always just been really, really scared of being out of my boat in the water, probably because the first time it happened to me, I almost drowned. So over the years, I've developed a really good roll, really good brace, and I try to use good judgment so that doesn't happen, but obviously the addition of a sail changes that equation. So. I ended up out of the boat and I really wished I had my toe tether at that point because I could have clipped into the boat and I wouldn't have been so worried about losing it to the wind. I'm really glad that I had perimeter lines all the way around because I was able to keep a good grip on my boat while I decided what I wanted to do. First thing I did was swim to the back of the boat and just start trying to swim the boat to shore. I was only about 100 yards offshore at that point, which is as far as I let myself get because I knew there was a possibility this could happen and I didn't believe that I could swim any further than that if I had to. So realized pretty quickly I didn't want to do that. So I tried to set up for a self-rescue. I was pretty weak at that point just because of my illness and my lack of fitness. I tried to do a really simple cowboy rescue. So boat was still sitting reasonably high in the water and I just went ahead and climbed over the back deck tried to get into the cockpit and immediately fell out into the other side of the water. And the big mistake that I made right there was I was rushing the process. If I would have just relaxed a little bit, I think I could have gotten a little bit more water out of the boat. I could have gotten the boat headed into the wind to where it wouldn't have had that sideways wind pressure. And then if I just would have collected myself and worked through that self-rescue slower, I think there's a better chance that that could have worked. Although I'm still pretty skeptical because it is pretty hard to self-rescue a skin on frame boat that doesn't have a lot of flotation. And the 40 liters of flotation I had in each end do not qualify as a lot of flotation. So at that point I had a choice to make. I realized that if this was a survival situation, let's say I was out in the middle of the ocean, what I would have done is I would have taken both my Greenland paddles off the deck, I would have set them up as two different outriggers on either side, and then I would have used that to stabilize myself while I would have gotten back in, and then I would have pumped the boat out, which would have taken a very long time. But considering that I was relatively close to shore, I made the judgment call that it was probably going to take as much energy just to start swimming to shore as it was to continue doing self-rescues that may not be successful. So I went to the back of the boat and I just grabbed onto it. I had a loop of rope in my pocket and I hooked that around the rudder and I hooked that around my arm so I could swim at the same time with the boat. And this kind of goes back to the mistake that I made earlier, not bringing my tow belt because if I would have brought my tow belt, what I could have done is just clip that five foot tow tether to the bow or the stern, and then I could have started swimming with both hands with my paddle, and I would have gotten to shore so much faster. But because I didn't have my tow tether, I was just kicking with my legs and holding on to the boat, and what ended up happening is it took me about 25 minutes in the water to swim the boat 100 yards over to shore, and I was pretty wiped out by the time I got there. I mean, I wasn't like survival exhausted, but I definitely was a little bit rattled and I wasn't super happy with the whole situation. So got the boat out of the water, took a look at it, um, realized that there was no way I was gonna get back on the water with a broken rudder, cleats that were slipping, 40 mile per hour winds, and a sail that was oversized when I was already exhausted. Uh, popped up the cell phone, started looking at Google Earth to see where I was. Luckily, the highway was pretty close. Unluckily, there was a railroad track and a slope that was about 45 degrees up to the highway. So had a conference with Liz on the cell phone, shared, did some screenshot shares of where I was on Google Earth, and we made a plan to get the boat out. And then Liz and her brother helped me carry the boat up some really unpleasant uh, slopes covered with poison oak. We had to drag it across the railroad tracks and overall it was a pretty miserable extraction. So that's kind of the download from the experience here. As far as what went wrong, I think it's pretty obvious because we've already talked about it. 
I was out in conditions that were way beyond what I should have been out in. I was in a boat that wasn't working very well in those conditions with a sail that was oversized for those conditions, doing it in a body that is not strong enough to be paddling in those conditions right now with skills that haven't been practiced in the last 15 years or so just because of my chronic illness. Also, I had undersized float bags, which did keep the boat on the surface, but weren't big enough to allow me to do a self-rescue. And if I was really serious about doing a self-rescue in those conditions, I really should have been paddling with a sea sock. So I wasn't set up exactly how I should be, but as far as the things that I did right, I had perimeter lines all the way around my boat, so I had something to hold on to when I came out of the boat. I did have some flotation in the boat, so it didn't sink on me, and I was able to swim it over to shore. I had a spare hat, I had spare food, I had spare water, I had a communication device, and I had a dry bag full of warm clothes for when I got to shore. And most importantly, I had a plan for the worst case scenario. And this plan could have changed depending on what we saw when we got down to the water. The forecast that day was for the winds coming out of the northwest, and the river was curving up to the northeast. And so what that told me is that even if I ended up out of my boat, the wind would slowly push me over to the shoreline. If I had gotten down to the park that day, or if the winds had been forecast out of the west or the southwest, there's no way I would have launched in those conditions because a capsize would have ended up slowly pushing me out into the shipping channel. Now, as far as what comes next here for the kayak version of our sailing system, as much as I really don't have time to do this right now, I'm gonna hit the pause button and build myself a brand new, completely stock F1 kayak. That way, as I continue my solo sailing experiments, I'm doing it on the exact same boat that my students would be building. I think I'm gonna be moving the center of effort of the sail back about three inches. Originally, I kept pushing it further and further forward based on the logic that it would help to pull the boat downwind a little more. But in a boat as short as the F1 and as maneuverable as the F1, what ended up happening is that the extra downward force from the mast just digs the bow in and actually makes it hunt and weathercock even worse. So I'm gonna move the sail step a little bit further back. I'm switching out the open clam cleats to closed clam cleats, and I'm gonna be recommending aluminum clam cleats for anyone sailing in winds higher than 20 miles per hour. I'm gonna keep testing this particular boat and its partner in catamaran mode. I've also got a pair of LPBs that I need to test in catamaran mode. And I'm going to be doing a little bit more solo sail testing in my LPB design as well, which I've already done a lot of in the past. And the LPB actually does sail a little bit better than the F1, just because it's longer and it has more directional stability. But being a fitness oriented kayak, it's got a little bit narrower waterline than most modern sea kayaks. And that combined with being a lighter weight skin boat means that it's gonna be a little bit twitchier under sail. And I think that's a good point to finish on because as much as I would like to think that skin boats do everything as well or better than other types of kayaks, that's just simply not true. There is no one type of kayak or one type of kayak construction that does everything well. Everything is just trade-offs and compromises. And the trade-off and compromise about putting a sail on a skin boat is that because it's a lighter weight boat, if you're not paddling it with a load, let's say you're not going out camping, it's gonna be twitchier under sail than a comparable fiberglass or plastic boat that's a lot heavier. And what that means is that when you first put the sail on your boat, you're gonna really need to put in the time to test it in controlled conditions where you're pushing it as hard as you would ever push it out in more extreme conditions, but just closer to shore with safety boaters so you can really learn the limitations of the system and get comfortable with it before you get out into a more serious situation where you get into trouble. And really that's no different than how you should approach sailing in any sea kayak. I think it's just important to emphasize the point because unloaded skin boats are twitchier under sail than heavier fiberglass or plastic boats. And as far as my part of that equation, I'm gonna keep working on this design here. I'm hoping to get this whole system released sometime around the end of September. But as always, if I run into any problems or I'm not completely satisfied with how everything's coming together, it's gonna to take as long as it takes because it's super important to me to make sure that everything is as strong and as safe as it can be before I release it, keeping in mind that most of kayak sailing safety has to do with your judgment and how you use the boat in the first place. All right, 
I think that's it for now. If you like this video, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. Also think about clicking that notification bell so every time we release a new video, it shows up in your feed. You can also find us on our website, capefalconkayaks.com, where I've got a bunch more skin on frame video courses, plan sets, and various free skin on frame resources. You can find us on Instagram, at Cape Falcon Builds, where I post a daily build blog of everything I'm working on here in the shop. And just like I say every time, even if you're not normally a social media person, I would really encourage you to check out the Instagram feed because there is so much more cool stuff that shows up there than ever shows up here on the YouTube channel. All right, that's it for now. Take care, be safe on the water, and have fun building your skin boat.